Georgia. You know, I think most of you know that we moved, we, I, I spent a lot of years in Portland, Oregon, and we moved from there to uh, Georgia, and I'm just so glad that I'm not in Portland right now. This is, we have 79 degrees and sunshine, crystal clear. I don't know, I think I, think I moved to paradise. So uh, for now, anyway, in August, it will be a different story completely. So welcome to uh, Spiritual Formation. And Kareem just joined us. I don't know if you guys get the little message that comes across your screen, but whenever somebody joins, I get a, you know, an announcement. So Kareem, it's good having you with us tonight. I can't believe that it's our very last sixth and very last session that we're having tonight here together on Collaborate. Welcome, Andrew. And so uh, it's good to be back together again. You know, I know it takes a chunk out of our Tuesday night, but, you know, I think I'm going to kind of miss it when we're not doing this, you know, finding a way to get back together again. So here we are, uh, week six, and uh, once again, Tuesday night, it's time to collaborate. All of you know the drill by now in terms of using the set of wizard if you need to and, uh, you know, uh, reviewing your communication options. You all do so very well. You know, after we had a bit of a meltdown on week one, session one, I think we kind of mastered the process. So um, uh, it, it, we, we, we know Collaborate now. Do any of you have Collaborate sessions with your other classes? I know Beryl does. I remember her telling me early on that you uh, also had other collaborate sessions. So it's good to have you with us tonight. Uh, Caleb is back with us. Welcome, Caleb. Uh, it's good to be together. I'm looking forward to kind of wrapping up some great, you know, discussion tonight. I'm very interested in seeing whether or not you are have questions. Usually when we come to the toward the end of a class, people are, okay, what was that assignment again? Or how do I submit it? Or, you know, did I, you know, did you did you record my grade? You know, that kind of technical kind of thing. So we have, um, I'll make sure we get an opportunity to do that tonight. But you know what? We're trusting the Lord to be with us. Uh, we don't want to just spin our wheels for 60 minutes. We want to feel like we are in the school of the spirit, that we're, you know, spending some time uh, not only listening to each other, but listening to the Lord as well. I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're being blessed in a sense as a result of this time together. So I wonder if you would join me in prayer as we begin this collaborate session. Father, I just thank you for these great students. I thank you for the work of your grace in, your, in their lives, the testimony that they are, the ways that you have used them as representatives of your kingdom and how that's only going to grow and expand in the years that are ahead. And I just thank you. I give you praise and, and glory for that, Father. So we give this time to you. We give ourselves to you. We pray that you would just have access to our thoughts and our hearts that you would reinforce in our understanding those things that you feel are important for us as we are together tonight, Father. We trust in you to teach us by your spirit and just, just continue to help us grow. We're just so passionate about the character of Jesus being formed within our hearts and within our lives. And so we thank you that this class has given us a bit of a kickstart and moved us along the way uh, uh, in some important ways. And we're trusting in that process to continue on after we're done with this class. Father, we thank you in advance for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends. Uh, let me know now if you have any questions about the class assignments. You know, week seven is the big week when it comes to your portfolio. Do you have any questions about that assignment? Uh, anything else that I can help you with tonight while we're together? Anybody? Everybody good? Everybody happy? I'm happy. Oh, well, this is good. 
No questions then? No questions. Thank you, sir. All right, my friends. Uh, I want to hit on a couple of key ideas that uh, are kind of at the end of our our study together. And, you know, I was reviewing some of the great PowerPoint uh, presentations that, that Dr. Crabtree uh, created. I'm sure she created them for her live class. This class, of course, started out as, as true with all the online classes as a live class. Kiara, I hope you're not having technical difficulties. I see you coming in and out. Uh, maybe your computer's giving you fits like mine was earlier. So anyway, you know, Dr. Crabtree uh, taught this class on campus, and she, you know, had to teach and give presentation. We get the benefit of that. So I was reviewing some of the PowerPoint presentations that she made available to us and picked out what I thought were some of the some of the really important key ideas. Uh, one of the one of the presentations I really loved that she did are simply called "Critical Junctures in the Spiritual Formation of Seminary Students." Now, you know, the purpose of that presentation was to point out that as a as a seminary student, wherever you are in life, otherwise, you know, as I appreciate some of you are are taking this course and other graduate courses. Uh, for vocational reasons. You're already pastors, you have a background in pastoral leadership of one kind or another. Uh, others of you are engaged, at least so far as you know, you know, right now, for just for personal kind of reasons, you know, you want to be stretched, you want to learn, you want to grow, and who knows what the Lord has in mind for you know in the years that are ahead. But I love the fact that Dr. Crabtree focused on the unique experience and the unique need that we have for spiritual formation as students, as seminary students. I, I don't know that it would surprise some of you to learn that there are some seminaries in the United States that have a very high divorce rate among students, in other words, while being students. And it's because they somehow have an imbalanced approach to their study. You know, maybe they're just, uh, you know, I've discovered that some students only read the Bible now to fulfill an assignment. They never read for personal enrichment or reflection. And so it, it actually hurts them spiritually. I hope that wouldn't shock any of you, you know. So I think it's very important to understand that there are unique uh, you know, critical junctures, as Dr. Crabtree pointed it out. So let's take a moment to look at this slide and, and give you an opportunity to tell me what you think. Learning to be salt and light in one's immediate academic setting is, is the challenge and it is the opportunity. You know, salt and light means it's just the nature of our redemptive influence. So here's the formation issue. Learning how God is working through one's giftings temperament, personality, and sense of vocation. Now that's, you know, that's true for you as a seminary student in general, but I think it's uniquely true in this class because those are the kinds of issues that are very specifically addressed and you have the opportunity to explore them. And so, you know, we, in order to grow uh, in Christ-likeness, grow as kingdom representatives, these are uh, issues that are very important to us. We want to know about how God has gifted us spiritually. Uh, can we find out something about, you know, our personality and our temperament, especially in the context of God's grace working in our life? And what about vocation? What about mission and vision? Uh, it's, it's extremely important, I think, as seminary students. It's important for me to be able to reflect on these key issues and to begin to get some clarity and to the extent that we do, I think it helps to pave the road in front of us so that we're not only growing spiritually, but it also, it's providing direction and it's providing an increased sense of purpose and so forth. And so she said that there are several helpful disciplines in the process of, of growing in these issues. Uh, there's appropriate assessment tools, which we've had, obviously, in this class. Uh, there is a, a relationships in community, uh, and I'm so pleased to, to know and to find out about your experience of community. 
Uh, there's uh, the experience of prayer, and you know, prayer is just about communication with God. So it's important that it be personal and and intimate and thoughtful. Journaling, you know, journaling is not for everyone. Uh, not for everyone. If if you're somebody like me, and your your most natural mode of communication is writing, then it it works for you. You know, some people are extremely verbal, and so journaling is just like confusing, you know. So that works for some more than for others. And obviously, reflecting on and developing greater clarity in your sense of vision and your sense of mission is very, very important. So these are kind of disciplines, but they're they're ones that all seminary students really, if they want to grow, need to address. And fortunately, uh, we are very, very specific about addressing those here in this class. So. Let me know, tell me about your experience, uh, not only in this class, but maybe kind of in general, of dealing with these formation issues. Uh, the, 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 your awareness of your spiritual giftings, what your discoveries about your personal style have, you know, how has that helped you, your sense of vocation. Uh, these are our issues. So what has been your experience, either in this class or or beyond when it comes to these formation issues. Anyone just jump in and let us know. Anyone feel free. All right, I'll give it a shot. Um, I, I think it, it's really, when you see them written down like this, I think it, it gives you pause to to try to see what works best for you. Um, I, I've taken some seminary courses and, and also in this course, and I found that um, it seems like the students work together pretty well, uh, supporting each other. And maybe not as much in some of the secular classes that I've taken. Um, I don't know if it's because you feel like you have to, um, but it seems to me that, that all of these things are important for you to take into um, class, life, work, whatever. Um, but to see them written down, it, it helps me, it helps remind me to measure myself against these to make sure that I'm staying on track. Well, that's definitely true, Bob, and I think uh, you're you're right in being able to clarify the issues, the formation issues. I don't know that everyone thinks of them as formation issues. Uh, how many people do you know have never really given thought to exploring and discovering their spiritual gifts? Now, it's a fairly common nowadays, but not everyone realizes that that's a vital element. In, in their uh, in their own spiritual formation, uh, and and some people object to doing a personality assessment. They think, well, you know, it's all the grace of God anyway. But actually, discovering how God has designed you says something about God's purpose in your life. So all of these are very important issues. And and my again, my question for reflection, uh, I saw somebody in the chat ask. My question really is, what has your experience been either in this class or beyond when it comes to these formation issues? How have you experienced that or addressed them in your own life? Hi, Candace. Hi, I'm Greg. Can you guys hear me clearly? Hello, can you guys hear me clearly? We can hear you, Candace. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, I do apologize for the noise. I'm actually uh, at Panera Bread. Um, but I think that um, my personality, being fairly open um, with what my challenge is and what my gifts are, I feel like um, God has actually revealed how even beyond like just my own healing, how my sharing has actually helped others 
uh, to feel comfortable with sharing and reassured others that they are not in this alone. So that um, my feeling like I'm adding, you know, a bit of salt to the conversation, you know, a bit of flavor, you know, or, or different perspective has actually proven uh, to be a bit of light. Uh, so that's been my my experience in this class, and others have done the same for me. They've made it easier for me to be able to actually see myself more clearly, and I appreciate that. I so appreciate you uh, framing it in that way, uh, Candace, because, again, at the beginning of this slide, it's learn it says we're learning how to be salt and light, and so it's not just about the fact that we have personal growth opportunities and goals and so forth, but in the end, it's really about that resulting in us being salt and light. So I appreciate you saying it that, and I, I'm wondering whether or not, even in the context of this class, if any of you have found that the Lord has been using you, you know, to, as Candace said, to be a salt and light, to be an example somehow to be a blessing to someone as a result of your experiences maybe uh, so far in this class. Have you discovered that the Lord has been using you as salt and light in the last few weeks? Robert says yes. Francis says yes. Definitely, Candace. Anyone else? Share an example if you have one. Uh, I have an example. Yes, Tony. Can you hear me there, Dr. Larry? I can, absolutely. Okay, uh, just an hour ago, um, I'm a worship pastor here at our church, and I met with one of the women that uh, also leads worship with me, and we were just talking through the motivational gifts and just really recognized uh, she's definitely a perceiver. And so just talking through that with her, um, it was something that she thought of a little bit before, but I think going through different aspects of the book really brought a lot of life to um, her, uh, just thinking about who she is, how God created her, even the role that she has on our worship team and leading worship at our church. I think just talking through those things with her was a blessing there. And so that was good. Well, those are really helpful insights, aren't they, when it comes to uh, spiritual gifts. So one, another great example of the fact that when we, we gain an insight like that, it's it's to be expected, I would think, that the Lord would give us an opportunity to bless someone else with the implications of what it is that, uh, that what a, what it is that we've been learning regarding uh, spiritual gifts and so forth. Any other examples that you would like to uh, share? This is just a great idea. Karen, hi. Hello, it's Karen. Can you hear me? Hi. Hope I don't go off here. A uh, couple of things. First of all, I was sharing with my granddaughter, um, who I believe is a per perceiver as well, some of the aspects of the uh, motivational gift perception and so on. And she was really excited, being a young teenager, to find out that God could use her in such a way to help other people. She, she got a pretty low self-esteem, so that was exciting for her. And secondly, the thought that I had was, when I first started this, um, I, I kind of balk against anything that sounds like psychological, um, you know, psychological stuff that you might get from any psychologist. And, and try and remember this is something that you hear that you're getting from God, not from somebody that's been schooled in psychology. And uh, one of the things that my husband reminded me is that psychology gets all of their stuff out of the Bible and they don't even know it. So it's kind of neat to see how uh, what we learn from these tools and what God is showing us in our giftings and so on relates to things in the world and how we can work with other people. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Ronaldo, you must be home now. Uh, you're absolutely right, Karen, that uh, you, to, to the extent that a psychologist or a biologist or a physicist or, you know, anybody, 
uh, has a, a something that's true, something that really works because God designed it that way. Well, you know, they didn't invent that idea. They discovered it. And so and not every idea that they have is true or works or is helpful. So I think that's absolutely true. And, and being able to understand, like, our spiritual gifts, uh, we didn't do any, uh, you know, personality assessments in this class, but there are some great ones that are faith, kind of faith-based, you know, classically the DISC, D-I-S-C, some of you are aware of that uh, assessment, so that they, they kind of filter through ideas that are very old, very ancient, but through a kind of a, a faith grid so that you can come out of it with a better understanding. Now, I'm convinced that the Lord made every one of us on purpose, and there are no throwaway human beings. And so everybody has a divine uh, design. And discovering what that is then says a lot about the specific ways that we have been designed to bear fruit most efficiently, if I can say it that way. You know, as leaders, we have to do a lot of stuff uh, because we're responsible for it, you know, whether or not it comes naturally to us or we're gifted in that area. But you know that you're most fruitful and most fulfilled, if I can say it that way, to the extent that you're functioning in the unique way that God has, you know, designed you. And so having a, an awareness of that can be very, very uh, helpful. And it's so great that you were able to share that and bless a member of your family with that, Karen. That's awesome. Uh, I wanted to spend some time tonight just kind of reflecting together on the whole area of vision and mission. There is, a, again, a whole assignment, you know, in our class regarding this. And I, you know, the longer I live, the more I feel, for me personally, that this is a very important area. Uh, and some, you know, like Karen, you were saying that we're, you know, we hesitate to do anything that sounds psychological and because this whole issue of a vision and mission statement now is popular in the business community then we say well you know this if, if businessmen like it how good can it be well I again I don't know that they invented the idea I think they discovered it and so this kind of uh, flows out of our discovery of how it is uh, God has designed it so I thought it would be good to take a little bit of time uh, this evening to talk about more specifically the whole area of vision and mission. I would love, you know, I'm going to be able to read all of your uh, portfolios, uh, and some of it is personal information, so you wouldn't want necessarily a lot of people reading it. But the vision and mission statements are one of those things that I think just blesses everybody to be able to, as you come to a, a place of greater clarity in your own life and mind and, you know, ministry, uh, it, it really frames it in well. So a vision, understanding vision is really understanding how God sees you and therefore how you see yourself, how you picture yourself ideally in Christ. So, you know, the definition that was on a slide that was given to us of vision is that it's a stated revelation of God to a specific community or individual relating to an overarching goal or goals which connect God and the community, connect God and the individual in kingdom purposes, ultimately to the glory of God. Uh, and so being able to say, this is my, ultimately this is uh, who I am in Christ, and therefore this is what I'm passionate about, and this uh, very much determines what will be the most fruitful in my life. You know, I, I have to tell you, I went through this. Maybe I shouldn't give you a personal example, but uh, last year, because, you know, we're Amer I'm an American, and when I was a, uh, an undergraduate, I was a political science, you know, major. And so we, we get very, uh, you know, we get very uh, upset. We get excited, you know, during a presidential campaign. And the one we had last year was, just a nightmare in my in my personal experience. I voted for every president since 1972, and you have to admit last year was unique, you know. And so I found myself uh, making statements about it, 
And every time, now I'm on Facebook, you know, and the reason why I got on Facebook is that's the only way I can see pictures of our grandchildren. Because our kids don't make paper pictures anymore and send them to the old people, you know. So I can see regular pictures of my grand and their dogs on Facebook. So I found myself making, you know, politically oriented, trying to be careful, you know, politically oriented kinds of state. Every time I did it was a disaster. It was like all hell broke loose. It was like hate speech coming from every direction. I think, my Lord, you know, I'm a nice guy. I don't know what you people are. And finally, the Lord reminded me, okay, what is your vision? And my, I tell you personally, my vision is to know Christ and to make him known. And I realized, you know, just because I think I'm smart and I'm an American and I have opinions when it comes to a presidential election, that, that's, that I, I should be able to make that contribution. Well, yes, but my vision is a, is a more accurate definition of the contribution that I can make. Does that make sense? And so I think for you as individuals and then for groups that you lead, to be able to see a vision of how God sees you and therefore what your unique contribution really in any situation can be is a powerful, powerful thing. Now, what have the rest of you experienced when it comes to this whole issue of vision and has the need to deal with it in our class been helpful so far to you? I'm looking for you to jump in. How is Andrew? Yes, go ahead. Who's there? Likewise. Andrew, good to see you. Um, I was thinking at first about the vision of what I would like to do for others, as far as the church itself, the young young um, teenagers in the church, and things of that nature. But as far as my vision, I would still say I want to be, you know, I want to be um, whole with God. But I also, my main vision to me is to help others. Once again, that's how crazy I want to help. The, I, I, I'm more about helping the, the uh, teenagers in my church than I am about helping myself right now. Mm -hmm. Because I see them very vulnerable and the things that's happening these days. And I've been there. And... I'm not sure how much longer I have on this earth, but I think I, the time I have left is to, I need to use it to help others. Well, I, I love that, you know, Andrew, because this whole area of being servant leaders is important to us, isn't it? So it was Jesus that made uh, set the example for us by saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And so, you know, that's a hard that's a hard example, but there's no question that it is distinctive to our lives and our sense of vision as as uh, followers of Jesus, isn't it? Yes. And like I said, at my age, <laughs> um, I'm not telling my age, but I have been through um, quite a bit as far as military, law enforcement, everything that nature, and I have seen quite a bit. And I think I'm put here for more of a purpose than just self. I'm not sure if that's know how that sounds to you, but that's my vision to help others. That's great. And, you know, you're absolutely right when you say that God has given you valuable experiences. So you've learned wisdom along the way. You know, wisdom is just evaluated experience. Uh, and you've learned wisdom, and that wisdom can be shared, and you have a passion for uh, helping others to not necessarily make some of the mis same mistakes or unnecessary mistakes. If they will learn from your wisdom, it will save them a lot of heartache, won't it? Exactly. That's my thinking. Thank you. So, Adrian, good to have you. I saw you jump in. We're talking about this whole area of vision and mission. Uh, mission, and mission comes around now to what we were just discussing with Michael uh, and Andrew, rather. Mission, then, vision is how we see ourselves in Christ, and it's kind of the ideal view, you know. It's, 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 sometimes it doesn't seem totally 
practical, but it works itself out. It provides a sense of focus and direction. And I think it helps us sort through a lot of things that we do or, or maybe would want to do that are not necessarily the best contribution for us. So mission gets more specific because mission is what we see ourselves therefore doing. So what are the what are the therefore the unique contributions that God has designed us to make in almost any situation? Uh, having you know this overarching uh, set of uh, uh, of a vision, you know, then how is it that God wants us? What's that contribution? Uh, you know, Andrew was just saying that he has a passion now to help kids, to serve kids, young people. Uh, in uh, his congregation and in looking for very important and relevant ways to do that. So you remember on the slide that was given to us, the definition of mission is a statement of purpose expressed in terms of the principal result toward which the vision is directed. It generally elaborates its fundamental aims in terms of two or three major thrusts. These major thrusts provide more focused Specificity of direction, enabling an individual or an organization's leadership to allocate resources in high priority areas. So again, think of it in terms of, okay, based upon my vision and my growing understanding of how God has designed me, you know, to bear fruit, then what are the kinds of things that I ought to focus my energy and my time and my resources on? Because I can't do everything. And there's a lot of things that I see need to be done. But what are the unique things, the, the kind of the kingdom assignments that God has for me in my life? Now, that's individual, but then it's, it's, in, the, it's in the corporate body as well. You know, it's in the organization, uh, wherever we are serving as uh, leaders. And so uh, in the same way, I'm kind of interested in how having to grapple with the issue of your mission and, you know, the whole assignment of vision and mission statements, how that has worked out in your life and experience. What kind of clarity did you come to in your own life, and did you find that helpful? Anybody, just go ahead and give us an example. PR is having difficulty with their technology. How I has how okay? And Corrine, welcome. Yes, Corrine. So um, recently, I've been grappling with this question, and my prayer has been for God to use me, however He wants to use me, and that's been a prayer for about two years. Um, and then it kind of came on to me that I needed to go into ministry and. You know, here I am in seminary. And then the further question is, you know, what is this going to look like and where are you leading me to? And I was trying to get a position in my local church, um, which I wasn't able to get. And I was really, really mad at God. Um, like, I don't understand. You want me in ministry, but then you, then you don't open these doors for me. And then, um, you know, we talk, we're talking about mission and, and vision and, God, um, in the midst of one of my prayers, just said, you know, I'm going to give you everything that you want, but we're not going to do it your way. You have to do it my way. And um, you need to go and you need to teach people how to become better followers. Um, and you need to quit your job to do that. It was a very specific um, prayer, and it was a very specific answer. And because of that, I quit my job and am now working full-time as a full-time volunteer in ministry. And the interesting part is that the mission is becoming clearer as I'm walking further along this path. So whereas I knew I wanted to work in ministry, now it's coming on to, well, I really want to work in the area of discipleship. Um, I'm not very good at um, evangelizing, but I am much better at shepherding people once they have kind of said yes to Christ, and um, then I feel like it's been even refined more towards women, and so I feel like that mission, vision is just 
forming as I slowly walk along this path. And it's not what I thought it would be, but it's obviously what God knew it would be. Well, I, I noticed Jeremy agreeing with you, Corrine, because the, the, there's a, a, a working out of a sense of mission. And what does that mean uh, specifically? Because we tend to start generally, don't we? And so because it, there are huge, potentially huge vocational questions along the way. So that's why you, you know, you, you stepped out of the boat a little bit and applied for a position. And then the Lord said, well, you know, you kind of had the right idea, but this is more specifically what you want to do. You know why I think this is important, Corrine and Jeremy and the rest of you are grappling with this? If you are a very gifted person, you're hardworking, people know you're hardworking, you're a responsible person, you're an influential person, you can end up doing a lot of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to begin to read about burn out in the ministry, etc. And, and you don't have to be a pastor to burn out. I mean, you can be a volunteer in the children's program and burn out. And so I think the best way to avoid, you know, burning out is to come back to this issue of vision and mission and say, okay, well, the Lord hasn't designed me. I'm capable of doing a lot of stuff, but not all of it is necessarily the most fruitful use of my time. So I need to come back to an understanding of how God has designed me to make a contribution and focus on those areas. Now, I have to tell you, to the extent that you're serving in an area where you are gifted, it will energize you. To the extent that you're serving in an area just because you're, you know, a, a hard worker or, a, or you have a servant's attitude or whatever, you know how it happens then you will find those areas to be more draining. And I think we kind of learn that as we go along. So part of discovering mission is not only having greater clarity in our own minds, but also experiencing the outworking of that in practical kinds of ways. Have any of the rest of you experienced that? Melissa said she was having trouble with her, her two-year-old. I'm sorry, Melissa, better you than me, I have to tell you. God bless you. I hope nobody in this class has ever experienced burnout or, or realized that you were heading in that direction. Have you? And if so, how did you, uh, how did you address that? Well, Professor, I is going Go ahead, John. Well, I had um, I had shared about that um, in this portfolio a bit, maybe even in my, in my discussion questions. But um, I couldn't help but think of burnout, even when you discussed the initial question about the types of spiritual formation that um, that you know I learned or was taught when I was younger. And uh, honestly, I feel like a lot of what we do is um, there's such a glaring need in churches. And in ministry, that um, that we have, um, we pull a lot of people and throw them right into the fire uh, without teaching them a lot. So, um, and t uh, sooner or later, obviously, um, you end up burnt out because you don't have much to start with. And I think that's happened to me on occasion. Um, and it's something that's difficult to unlearn. I think about some of these sports guys that have to go and re work their throwing motion and it takes 10,000 reps and three months of distinct work to get there. And I think once you've had a burnout situation, I think you're, you're very apt to do it again um, unless you can relearn disciplines in a, in a whole different manner. Yes, I agree, John. I think the worst thing to do for somebody who has experienced burnout you know, my own dad ended up in Florida because he burned out as a pastor in Missouri. And it was painful to watch, quite frankly, and the depression and the exhaustion and all that went with it. I think the worst thing you can do if you ever experience that is just throw in the towel, you know, and say, well, obviously God just does not want to use me or it's too painful to try to serve in this way or, you know, whatever. Obviously you need a time of healing and refreshing and, and restoration. But in the end, I agree with you, John. We need to say, okay, what happened? Why did that happen? How did that happen? 
and what can I learn for it, from it so I can go forward and be fruitful and effective without necessarily draining off too much life and energy in the process. Somebody else was getting ready to jump in, I think, when John was talking. Ask me, Professor um, Andrew, but he covered it quite Yes, well. Andrew. Uh, Scott had about the same thing I was, about, I was ready to say. He covered it quite well. All right. You know, we live and learn, don't we, Andrew? Yes, we do. And hopefully so, hopefully so, that I think there wouldn't, would, nothing would be sadder than somebody who just lives on and on and keeps making the same mistakes over again. I mean, all of us make mistakes, but learning from them is so valuable. So this, this thing of mission, I think, is huge, you know, and it kind of, as you, as you continue to go forward and grow, you will discover that, okay, these are the following two or three areas or whatever, you know, that are always going to be my very best contribution. Uh, and no, no matter what the setting, if I'm in a setting, I can tell you, if I'm, if I can, if I have the freedom to do the following things, that will be a very good contribution. I, I can do other things, and I maybe will for a while, but I've also discovered that they will over time start to be draining, so it's good to come back and say, okay, these are my very best contributions. This is my mission. This is my kingdom function. And these, this is the kind of fruit that God has designed me to, to bear. What a great, what a great lesson for us. Now, I'm going to put you in your, your small group, uh, discussion groups. And I, I would love, you know, cause I get to read your portfolios and the rest of you don't. But I find this area of spiritual gifts extremely important. I don't know if any of you uh, did your, a little assessment, you know, on the motivational gifts and decided, well, I, that's not the gift I want. I think that's wrong. I remember once I had a guy who was on the team with me, you know, and he did this this assessment and found out that his primary gift was administration. But he thought that was the worst news in the world. That absolutely cannot be right. Everybody around him was saying, no, no, that's, that's definitely. Uh, and so sometimes it's important to find a place of acceptance and then begin to explore the value of that deposit of God's grace in our life when it comes to our being able to bear fruit. So here's my question for you tonight. From your adult motivational gift profile, what was your top, did you find out your top spiritual gift? And then what did you conclude from that in terms of your life and of your ministry? I think this is just a great opportunity for you to discuss. I'm going to start the timer, I'm going to set it for 10 minutes, and and then I'm going to send you all into your, you know, your rooms to discuss this. You remember, we've got enough opportunity for video and microphone. You can all have them on while you're in the room, and it will work out just fine. So let's start our timer. I am going to... Uh, send you to your breakout rooms, and in 10 minutes we'll come back, and I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit of your conversation. So let's get started. Hello, is everybody still in your uh, breakout rooms?
Hello, is anybody with me in the main room? Um, yes, but I had to leave and join again. Oh, you did? I don't know what happened to the uh, breakout rooms. They seem to be my return everyone to the main room button is not working. Oh boy, I'm sorry. <laughs> let me try let me try this. Welcome back everybody. Hello. Oh, you did lose me. My my I had to try a couple of different ways to bring you back. I didn't know if the rapture had, the rapture happened or I got left behind or what was going on. Well, we did, we enjoyed having the extra time. All right, all right. Say, give me a sense of uh, of your discussions. How did it go? Uh, this is Adrian Starks. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Asplund? Hi, Adrian. Yes, it was very good uh, from our perspective. We uh, shared um, what our dominant or secondary uh, gifts were in uh, for uh, in our group, Karen's was perceiver, and she began to expound on uh, the delicate aspects of of being one who's uh, endowed with that sh gift as a as a predominant gift. And I, I shared personally how it was surprising to me that mine was giver uh, when I thought that it would have been. Uh, future, uh, in this particular moment, it turned out to be that it was giver. And uh, each of us gave our uh, perspective on, on what we thought uh, those gifts meant and how they manifested in our particular lives. Mm. That's interesting, uh, Adrian, because I know you're a pastor and uh, and you're looking for some really great givers in the congregation. <laughs> Does that really mean, you know? Uh, it's beautiful. There are, there are multi facets to all of these gifts, and it's beautiful to consider all the various ways in which they can be fruitful in a variety of contexts. One of the th one of the things I love about people with a gift of giver is they just seem to have a they have a gift when it comes to uh, and not only uh, you know when it comes to managing resources and they have the ability to teach others how to manage resources and uh, provide leadership in that area, which is you know it's, sometimes those gifts are broader than just the word that we use to describe them. That's a great yes. support. One of the things that I have to be mindful of is that everyone does not have that gift, and especially in my um, particular pathway, not to um, allow myself to get frustrated uh, as uh, I see the absence of that gift um, because it, it comes so easily for, for um, my wife and me. I shared with our group that uh, the blessing in this, the greater blessing, is that both my wife and I have been endowed with that gift. And so, whereas it may have caused strife or struggle in a relationship because one has it and the other doesn't, for us, both have it, and it works out very well. Mm. You know, that's it's a great uh, example as a leader, Adrian. I remember, you know, I... I pioneered a church when I was a young pastor. I was only 22 years old, actually. And so my primary gift, I think I've known from the beginning, was a teacher. So I was looking for the the Lord to send people into the congregation that had, you know, some kind of a similar gift. And, man, it wasn't happening. I was trying to start little Bible college or whatever. Nobody was interested. And so I thought, well, this is what, what's going on? So I needed to find out where the congregation was gifted. And did you know, I found out that 70% of the congregation had mercy or compassion as their number one gift. And that meant that as a congregation, we were called to engage the community in mercy ministries. And I had to just be honest about, you know, the, the mission of the congregation. So... I think there are a lot of great applications to these ideas of our of our spiritual gifts. What a great story. 
Anybody else have your discussion group go? Ours went real good. Uh, I think there were five of us, and pretty much nobody was surprised. Megan said she was a little bit surprised, but in kind of thinking about it, it made sense. So we uh, we all kind of felt like we were more or less already in line with uh, how these things were. So the Lord was already taking us in that direction, and some of us had been going in that direction for a long time. So. Mm. Yeah, pretty much kind of just said, yeah, that's, uh, that makes perfect sense. I think I saw a chat comment from Megan saying that at one point in time she worked in an area of administration, which, as it turned out, is not her number one gift. And it right, did lead to burnout. Page. Yeah, it led to burnout over time. You know, the fact is, again, we we can maybe do, we can do a lot of things just because we're capable. But being capable is not necessarily the same thing as being gifted. So I think uh, discerning the difference can be extremely helpful. Yeah, Dr. Ashman, uh, one of our uh, chat room members spoke of working in administration for some 30 plus years and that not being her gift, uh, her strong suit at all, and how it took her all of that time to become a good uh, administrator, uh, administrative assistant, if you will, and, and that just is uh, painful to me to think that, you know, considering the typical lifespan, uh, that someone would uh, miss the joy of being in their predominant gift because they are compelled or, or uh, find themselves in a, a necessary way having to continue in a pathway that they're not really, really suited for. Mm. Well, you know, Adrian, that brings up an interesting, you know, my last slide is kind of a picture of the seasons of life. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about myself. I turned 66 last Wednesday, which is not ancient, you know, but I think you do get to the point where, and, you know, my friend Karen is 75, I think I remember Karen saying, and I think the, it's like the longer we live, the more of a, a handle we have on who we are in Christ and what our vision and our mission is. And I think there's a natural kind of a sense of, well, you know, if I would have found that out, what, 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier, but, you know, we've been kind of finding this thing out gradually. And you remember our kingdom engagement really is just getting started, you know, because we have the big picture we believe in eternal life. We believe in the kingdom of God. And so I love this idea of the seasons of life uh, that all of us have. Uh, a spring, you know, and like, like here in Georgia, all the trees are blossoming and blooming. Everybody's nose is running as a result. And then we have summer where everything is in full bloom and all the, you know, the harvest. They come from a long line of farmers, you know, so the harvest is coming in. And then we come into the fall where the fall colors are beautiful. It's, but it's because there is early, there are buds pushing those leaves out and causing them to die. And some of them are prettier dead than others, you know. But it means that there's new life coming. And then in the winter time, when there's apparently nothing going on with the tree, what's actually happening is that the entire focus is on growth underneath the ground where you can't see it in the roots. And so every season of life has its unique growth opportunity. And that means that every season in life has a unique opportunity for fruitfulness as well. And I think, you know, you and I have to admit that, you know, if we, we're in it, every one of us are in a certain season of life. Everyone has unique potential. And everyone gives us a unique opportunity to discover uh, the contribution that the Lord has for us to make. And so what a great... What a great idea. And I want you all of you to know how much I appreciate you. Uh, this, As we get closer to the end of this class, don't hesitate to ask me to let me know how I can help you. You know, I'm here to serve you. I'm looking forward to, you know, all of us crossing the finish line of this class and moving on to, to do whatever the Lord has in store for us. It's a great adventure serving the Lord, is it not? It's, it's never a dull moment when we're just staying close to the Lord and serving Him. So.
God bless you, everyone. Bless somebody, you. somebody was jumping in just then. I didn't see who it was. Thank you, Dr. Asplund. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, my friends. And I'm still here. You know, we've got almost two weeks left to go. So I'm here to help you. Uh, just let me know what I can do for you along the way. I appreciate you, everyone. Thank you all. It's been great. Hey, we appreciate you too. Yeah. God bless you, folks. Yeah, I was saying this is Larry. I joined a little late. God bless you, Larry. It's been great having you in class. Peace out. Thank you. Well, they said, did you ever get your microphone to work? No, I'm sorry. Doctor, I got a quick question since I missed the beginning. Uh, thank you, Professor. This is Ronaldo. Ronaldo? No, yes, I was going to say thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm going to be sending you that email to schedule that uh, conversation for Thursday, uh, either later on today or Wednesday. I'll look for it, Ronaldo. Thank you, so much, thank you absolutely. Us. Michael, were you jumping in? I just had a quick question since I missed the beginning where you ask us for questions. Uh, I missed a couple of these sessions, and so I'm doing the re listening to recordings. I'm going to write the summary. You want me to just email those? Absolutely, Michael. Just send them to me as an email attachment. Okay. I'll be happy to receive them from you and then give you credit for participation. Okay, great. Thank you. Bless you, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Asplund, and thank you, class. It's been a great experience. All right, man. I appreciate you.